Matheson. This is on the intersection of obesity, COVID-19 and chronic disease. And our, our first activity will be a welcome from Dr. Victor Zhao. Mario. Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Victor Zhao, the president of National Academy of Medicine. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to the 51st National Academy of Medicine annual meeting. Thank you for spending your Sunday afternoon or morning in the West Coast with us. For members of the public who are joining us for the first time and may not be familiar with the National Academies, let me tell you a little bit about who we are. We were chartered by Congress and President Abraham Lincoln in 1863 as an independent advisor to the nation on matters of science, technology, and health. Over the years, we've gained a reputation of providing independent, science-based and trusted advice impacting the nation and the world. The National Academy of Medicine have distinguished members who are at the forefront of discovery and progress in health medicine and the biomedical sciences. Held every October, the NAM annual meeting is the gathering of our distinguished members and the most important meeting of the year for the organization. Now, COVID has created immense challenges for all of us over the past 20 months, but it's also offered opportunities to innovate and adapt. So last year, for the first time, we decided to conduct the meeting entirely virtually and open our interest group meetings to the public. This approach was really quite successful. We decided to continue it this year. Now the interest groups bring together NAM members from a variety of disciplines and sections to enrich the understanding and to engage in dynamic conversation on pertinent scientific and policy topics. You know, the program is driven totally by the NAM members all interest groups meet during the annual meeting. They may develop new ideas for program activities or other initiatives by the NAM and assist membership sections in the discovery of outstanding candidates for membership, especially young individuals working in interdisciplinary or emerging fields. In fact, I've been so impressed with the enthusiasm and engagement of members in the interest groups and the quality of interest group programs that I'm thinking of making the interest group program is part of the official scientific program every year in the future. So please stay tuned. So I hope you join the scientific program tomorrow. We have an outstanding program in store for all of you. The theme of this year's program is crossing the policy and equity chasm. Lessons learned from compounding health crisis. And it will focus on the importance of science-informed policy to address existential persistent health threats and inequities of COVID-19 and climate change. So it's going to be a great event with the keynote opening from Dr. Eric Lander, President Biden's science advisor, director of the White House Office of Science, Technology and Policy, and a member of the president's cabinet. In addition, there will be a number of distinguished speakers and leaders. Toward the end of the scientific meeting, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra, will deliver a closing keynote. After the scientific meeting, I'll chair the President's Forum, which will formally discuss the NAM's grand challenge in health, human health and climate change. The forum will kick off with an opening keynote address from Gina McCarthy, the White House National Climate Advisor. The scientific meeting will begin promptly at 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. And I hope I'll see you all there. And now over to the interest group session. Thank you. Welcome again to interest group 12, nutrition, diabetes, and obesity. And our pr program is on the intersection of obesity, COVID-19, and chronic disease. Um, I'm Diane Burt, and I 
chair of the interest group planning committee and Barbara Hansen is on and she is the co-chair. Also very engaged has been Connie Weaver in the planning of this as our, our past chair. Um, now we'll turn to Connie Weaver for induction, introduction of speakers. Um, I'm, I think you'll be uh, impressed and delighted with our program today. It, not any of us are longtime experts with COVID, but uh, the two speakers have done more than many of us in relating COVID to their interests. I'm going to introduce the first two speakers together. Uh, first up is Philip Calder. He is Professor of Nutritional Immunology at the University of Southampton. He's an internationally recognized researcher with 700 scientific publications. I first encountered Philip's wonderful work when he presented the award lecture for the Dannon International Prize for Nutrition he received in 2016. He is currently the president of the Federation of European Nutrition Societies, and he's a fellow of the Association for Nutrition um, since 2012. He's going to speak to us on obesity, immunity, and COVID. Then we're going to have a presentation by Scott Solomon, MD. He's the Edward F. Froelich Distinguished Chair, Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, Director of Non-Invasive Cardiology, and Senior Physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital. His research has focused on changes in ventricular function and structure following myocardial injury, modifiers of risk and influences of outcome in patients following myocardial infarction, and with chronic heart failure, cardiovascular safety of non-vascular cardiovascular therapies, factors that influence the transition from hypertension and heart failure, um, and heart failure itself. So he has authored more than 400 peer review articles, and he has authored two textbooks of cardiac imaging. He's the cardiac section editor and international associate editor at the European Heart Journal. He will be speaking to us about COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease, no surprise with those credentials. So I turn it over to uh, Professor Calder who is speaking on obesity, immunity, and COVID. Philip? Yeah, thanks very much, Connie. And thanks to uh, the organizers for inviting me to this uh, really important uh, meeting. Um, so I'm just sharing uh, my screen now. Uh, hopefully that's gone okay, Connie. Bring up yeah, it looks fine. Yep, great, thank you. Yeah, so I want to address the issue of obesity and immunity and whether that impacts on susceptibility to and severity of COVID-19. Um, so first of all, a few slides about the immune system, just to get everybody on the same page. Uh, the immune system is uh, a cell and tissue system that protects the host, the individual, uh, from harmful organisms, harmful bacteria, viruses, and so on. Of course, harmful organisms are termed pathogens. <clears throat> we know that a well-functioning immune system is key to providing robust defense against pathogens. And of course, we've heard a lot about that in the last uh, two years or so, uh, because we know people with compromised immunity are at increased risk of infectious disease and of infectious disease becoming more severe. <clears throat> The four general functional features of the immune system are listed here. Firstly, it acts as an exclusion barrier to keep pathogens out. Secondly, it's able to identify organisms and recognize whether they're harmful or harmless. Thirdly, it acts to eliminate those organisms identified as being harmful. And then finally, it has a memory component so that those immunological encounters are remembered, remembered immunologically, often for decades, sometimes even for uh, the entire life. And the point of the memory response is that reinfection or re-exposure generates a faster and more vigorous response than the first uh, exposure. 
Now, the memory response is the basis of vaccination, which, of course, is really topical right now. <clears throat> so the immune system is pretty uh, complex. It's pretty sophisticated. It can recognize, it can eliminate, and it can remember. <clears throat> These sophisticated capabilities come about because of the many different, particularly cellular components within the immune system, which, generally speaking, are divided into innate immunity, which includes the barrier functions, and acquired immunity. So we have all of these different cell types within both innate and acquired immunity. These different cell types have specialized functions. So for example, we have phagocytic cells that can engulf and digest bacteria intracellularly. We have natural killer cells that kill virally infected cells and tumor cells. Cytotoxic T cells do that as well. B cells are the cells that produce antibodies. We have regulatory cells and so on. So we have specialized cell functions but obviously to mount an effective immune response, all of these different cellular components have to be working together in an integrated and coordinated way. I picture that in this uh, more, uh, uh, perhaps more complicated figure that I'm not going to go through in detail, but simply showing the different cellular interactions that are involved in antiviral immunity with the aim being to kill virally infected cells, to block the replication of viruses and to neutralize viruses with antibodies. And we see important cytokines like the interferons that I'll come back to later on, uh, which are key to antiviral protection. We see these um, proteins, perforin and granzyme, that are key to the lysis of virally infected cells. And we see overall lots of different cells involved in eliciting effective antiviral immunity. But if we strip this back, we have these two general uh, functional capabilities. We have the barrier function to keep pathogens out. And then we have these powerful cellular components of innate and acquired immunity to deal with pathogens if they breach the barrier. Now, mostly people think of immune cells circulating in the bloodstream, the white blood cells. But in fact, only about 2% of our immune cells are in the bloodstream at any time. Most of our immune cells are actually locked away in tissues, places like the spleen, the lymph nodes, and the payers patches in the gut wall. These are places where immune cells come together, they interact with one another, and these are the places where the immunological decisions are made. Just to remind you what I already said, that weak immunity results in poor defense against harmful organisms. That results in turn in infections and inability to control infections. Now, of course, since early 2020, weak immune systems have been exposed as a major public health challenge in, in places where there wasn't such concern about communicable diseases. Of course, there are geographies where there's always been a big concern about communicable diseases, but uh, certainly they were considered less important or more controlled in, uh, in uh, North America and Europe, for example, than the non-communicable diseases. <clears throat> now, obesity has emerged as a major risk factor for severe COVID-19. I'm going to come back to that many times over. <clears throat> the key to this perhaps is that obesity impairs immunity. Obesity results in a weak immune system, a weak immune response. In fact, obesity impairs the activity of many important immune cells, some of which I've mentioned already. It reduces antibody responses, reduces the production of these important interferons involved in antiviral and antibacterial infection. So there's no doubt that people with obesity have a weakened immune response. They're also more susceptible to many infections, that's well documented, and also they don't respond so well to some vaccinations. I'm going to come back to these things a few times during my talk. In the H1N1 flu pandemic of 2009, it was identified that people with obesity had delayed and weak antiviral responses, and they recovered poorly from disease compared to normal weight individuals. And in fact, they have a prolonged period of flu virus shedding, and new, more virulent strains of the flu virus emerge in people with obesity because of their inability to control the virus. And as I'll show you later, 
uh, vaccinated individuals, this is in, uh, vaccinated with the seasonal flu vaccine, uh, with obesity, still have a higher risk of influenza than normal weight people, meaning the vaccines just don't work so well in people with obesity. <clears throat> This is an example of some of the sorts of studies that have been done. This is an in vitro study where cells were taken from the blood of healthy weight individuals, overweight individuals, and obese individuals. This is an American study. Those cells were incubated in culture with the influenza vaccine. So the influenza vaccine elicited uh, an immune response in vitro. And the researchers looked at different readouts of uh, immune factors that are important in antiviral immunity. Activation of cytotoxic T cells. These are the key cells to destroy virally infected cells. Production of this protein granzyme that's involved in lysis of virally infected cells and production of interferon gamma. And what you see is the cells taken from people with obesity have much weaker responses than cells taken from people with a healthy weight with cells from overweight individuals somewhere in between. So this is a study suggesting defective cytotoxic T cell activation and function in people with obesity. This is a busy slide, but it's exactly the same study design. Cells taken from people, healthy weight, overweight and obese, uh, then this time incubated with the flu virus, the pandemic H1N1 virus. The previous slide was with the flu vaccine. This is with the actual virus. Unstimulated cells are in the open bar. Cells stimulated or exposed to the flu virus are in the dark bars. And what you'll see is um, on some of these panels, these are all different immune cell uh, subtypes. On some of these panels, cells from individuals with obesity show a weaker response to the virus than cells from healthy people with the cells from overweight people in between. This is a good example here. These are interferon gamma and granzyme B producing cells. And you see there are reduced numbers with obesity, perhaps a 50% reduction with overweight being in between. These are interferon gamma producing uh, cytotoxic T cells, again, reduced with obesity. So just again, an indication that cells from people with obesity have weaker responses to viruses than cells taken from normal weight people with overweight being somewhere in between. So the cells have a weaker response. This is a paper which is currently available as a preprint. And what this is doing is looking at the types of antibodies that are produced upon flu vaccination in obese people compared with normal weight people. And essentially what these researchers showed was that not only is the vaccination response impaired in obese people compared to normal weight, but also the types of antibodies, the actual proteins that are produced, have a different structure in obese people compared to normal weight people. So their whole response to vaccination immunologically is different. They produce different antibodies. Now we know that the antibodies to the flu vaccine decline over time. And what this study is doing is documenting the relationship between body mass index and loss of uh, anti-flu vaccine antibodies. So this is the decline. So this is the loss of antibodies as a function of BMI. And what you see is the higher the BMI, the greater the decline. And if you divide those individuals uh, by healthy weight or obese, and you look at the decline to each of the three components of the trivalent uh, seasonal influenza vaccine, you see that, so this is percentage of people with a greater than fourfold decrease in antibodies over the follow-up period. You see that people with obesity are more likely to lose antibodies than people of normal weight. I think that's a way to summarize it. So they have a weak response, they produce different antibodies in terms of structure, and then they, the loss of antibodies is faster with obesity compared to normal weight. So if you put all of that together, it's maybe no surprise that uh, vaccines don't work so well in people with obesity. So this is um, a study that looked at the likelihood of individuals developing influenza-like illness or lab-confirmed influenza after vaccination for seasonal flu in obese compared to normal weight individuals. And they showed that the obese individuals 
were about twice as likely to develop flu post-vaccination as normal weight individuals, confirming this poor vaccination response and this more rapid loss of antibodies. Now, so the immune response is weak in people with obesity. <clears throat> we also know that adipose tissue becomes inflamed with obesity. There's infiltration of cells like macrophages and also T cells, and there's an inflammatory response within the adipose tissue with production of classic inflammatory cytokines. So this is the sort of picture you see in nice review articles. This is the real thing uh, taken by one of my students showing the macrophages here surrounding the adipocytes and interacting with the adipocytes. What my student did was uh, transcriptomics on adipose tissue taken from normal weight and obese individuals. And she found almost four and a half thousand genes were differentially expressed in obesity. 600 were upregulated at least twofold compared to normal weight and 175 downregulated at least twofold compared to normal weight. And these are the 25 most affected pathways. And if you look at this, almost all of these pathways are to do with immunity and inflammation. So we've got regulation of the immune response, acute phase response signaling, IL-8 signaling, IL-6 signaling. These are all NF-kappa B is down here somewhere. I think about 23 out of these 25 pathways are to do with inflammation and immunity. A couple are to do with metabolism. So OB, uh, adipose tissue in obese individuals has ramped up uh, inflammation. And the result of that is that people with obesity have higher blood levels of inflammatory markers compared to non-obese. So this is P-select and interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha in obese compared to non-obese women. And you see the concentrations are significantly higher. So the adipose tissue itself is inflamed. You've seen that. Blood levels of inflammatory markers are higher. What this means is adipose tissue is exporting its inflammation. And as a result of that, we get, if you like, secondary inflammation in places like liver and skeletal muscle and elsewhere. So we get, in the end, a whole body systemic inflammation and insulin resistance. <clears throat> Another interesting thing that happens is uh, changes in the thymus with obesity. So the thymus is the organ where T cells mature. Um, of course, the thymus shrinks as we age, the process of thymic involution. But it turns out that people with obesity also have smaller thymuses. And what that means is they have less capability to put out new T cells. And this is the relationship between um, uh, thymus size and body mass index. And this is thymus uh, size and uh, fatness. So the, I think there is a phenomenon like fatty liver, uh, which is the fatty thymus. And I think this could be impairing uh, the ability of obese people to generate T cell mediated immune responses. So obesity is linked to a weak immune response and increased low grade inflammation. <clears throat> um, now, I'm going to turn now to COVID-19. So this is the um, relationship in uh, uh, meta-analysis between uh, infection with coronavirus uh, in obesity compared with non-obese individuals. And you see that obese people, according to this meta-analysis, are somewhere between two and a half and three times more likely to be infected with uh, coronavirus compared to non-obese individuals. Um, I think part of this could be due to this immune impairment seen in obese individuals. So obesity could make people more susceptible to infection because their immune systems can't cope so well to exposure to bacteria and viruses. That is, their immune systems are weak. This is uh, COVID-19 data looking at anti-coronavirus uh, uh, antibodies as a function of BMI. So what this is showing is the higher the BMI, the lower the level of the antibodies. So this would be consistent with a weaker immune response in obese people. They just can't cope with uh, coronavirus infection. So they're not generating uh, sufficient antibody concentrations. Now, of course, poor outcome from COVID-19 is partly related to weak immunity and is partly related to excessive inflammation. Of course, there are other things involved as well. So this is an early study from China, 
looking at interleukin-6 as a marker of inflammation and blood lymphocytes as a marker of immunity. Those individuals who were, these were all um, uh, 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 severe COVID-19 patients. The individuals who survived are in blue. Those who didn't survive are in red. And you see the non-survivors have much greater inflammation and the non-survivors have lower lymphocyte numbers, so weaker uh, immunity. So it's possible that people with obesity are immunologically predisposed to poorer outcome from COVID-19 because of weak immunity and higher low-grade inflammation. So there's been enormous number of studies on obesity and COVID-19 outcomes. In fact, there are already more than 50 published meta-analyses of obesity and COVID-19 outcomes, which is pretty phenomenal. I'm gonna show you data from some of these uh, meta-analyses. So this is uh, the relationship of obesity and severe outcomes from COVID-19, showing that obesity increases the risk of severe COVID-19, increases risk of acute respiratory distress syndrome, increases risk of hospitalization with COVID-19 compared to uh, normal weight individuals. Likewise, obesity increases risk of the need for invasive mechanical ventilation and increases risk of uh, uh, ICU admission. The increases in risk are typically between about 1.5 and three times. Similar meta-analysis, again, these are univariate associations just comparing obese and non-obese, showing uh, increased risk of hospitalization, uh, increased risk of ICU admission, increased risk of uh, uh, invasive mechanical ventilation, increased risk of mortality in obese compared to non-obese individuals as a dichotomy. This is the multivariate association, so taking into account some other factors, but all of these uh, increased risks with obesity hold up in the multivariate association. So something like a two and a half fold increase, two and a half times increase in risk of hospitalization, ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, and mortality. Another meta-analysis, fewer studies here, but again, showing the same thing for these sorts of outcomes from severe COVID-19. Um, again, another study showing the same sort of picture. So those are all studies looking at obese compared to normal weight. It's interesting to look at the continuum of body mass index. This is data from uh, uh, six, nearly seven million people here in England, looking at the relationship between BMI and admission to hospital, admission to the ICU and mortality. So we've already seen that obesity increases the risk of these outcomes compared to normal weight. But what these data from England are showing is really that from a BMI of let's say about 25 or so, there's, a, there's basically a, um, a, a linear relationship uh, between um, BMI and these more severe outcomes. You're all from the US. So these are data from the American Heart Association registry. Um, slightly more complicated data than this, what I just showed you. So here we have three different outcomes. In black squares is death or need for mechanical ventilation. The blue is death alone, and the red is mechanical ventilation alone, according to overweight and obesity. And again, you see, I think, a dose response relationship, if you like, between body mass index and these severe outcomes, either individually or when they're put together as the combination of death uh, or, or need for mechanical ventilation in black. And then these are the relationships uh, according to age uh, and according to BMI for each of those outcomes. And I think the data are pretty similar to the uh, data from England, where essentially there's a, a, a dose response relationship between BMI and poor outcome from COVID-19. So a question is how does the effect of obesity compare with other risk factors that we've heard about like aging and being male? So this is a meta-analysis that looked at the effect of being aged more than 75 years, that looked at the effect of being male rather than female and looked at severe obesity compared to normal weight. 
And what this meta-analysis shows is that for all three of these factors individually, there's actually a roughly similar increase in risk, which is somewhere between two and a two and a half fold. Uh, so over 75 is about two fold higher risk of uh, severe COVID-19 compared to under 75. Male in this meta-analysis, about twice the risk as female and severe obesity about 2.6 times the risk compared to normal weight. <clears throat> so, so far I've talked about susceptibility to COVID-19 and severity of COVID-19. Another consequence which you might imagine from what I said earlier in my talk is obesity, another consequence of obesity associated immune weakness as I'm calling it, would be poor response to COVID-19 vaccines. And in fact, there are a couple of papers on that now. So this is uh, the effect of obesity on the antibody response to the first shot of the COVID-19 vaccine. And what they showed was a significantly uh, better response. This is antibody response to the first shot of the Pfizer vaccine in underweight or normal weight individuals compared to those with overweight or obesity. So a suggestion that overweight and obesity impair the vaccination response. And then this is uh, the relationship between waist circumference and antibodies to uh, after the second uh, shot of the Pfizer vaccine. So this is showing as waist circumference increases, the antibody concentration in the blood uh, uh, goes down. So these are two studies suggesting that obesity impairs the response to the COVID-19 uh, vaccination. So what are the links between obesity, susceptibility to COVID-19 and severity of COVID-19? So one of them could be what I've sort of proposed to you, which is that just obesity weakens immunity. So people with obesity per se are at greater risk of infection and they can't control the infection, so it's more likely to become severe. The second is that it's actually all to do with the pro-inflammatory environment of obesity, and this enables uh, or creates an environment to enable the disease to become more and more, more severe in individuals who are infected. The th the, related to this perhaps, but it's a slightly different way of viewing it, is actually this is because adipose tissue in obese individuals produces factors that somehow influence immunity and inflammation. So it's not the obesity per se, but it's the factors that the adipose tissue is producing. One of these might be leptin. So of course there's a relationship between leptin concentrations and body mass index. Um, and in fact, leptin is a cytokine. It's highly related to interleukin-6. And this is just to show you that leptin has a receptor, binds to its receptor, induces signaling, and that signaling triggers inflammation and also has impacts on the immune response. So it may be something to do with factors produced by adipose tissue in obese individuals. That is the link here. Now, of course, there might be some other things. Maybe it's not obesity at all. Maybe it's the obesogenic diet and lifestyle that increases risk. So both sugar and saturated fat have been shown to enhance inflammation. Many obesogenic diets are poor in essential nutrients and the micronutrients in particular are vital to immune function and inflammation control. Being physically fit also supports the immune system. So maybe it's to do with the diet and the lifestyle of obese individuals that those things are impacting their immune systems. Some people have said, actually, it's all about low, about low vitamin D because vitamin D is important to antiviral immunity, protects against respiratory illness. There are studies on vitamin D and COVID-19 infection and susceptibility. So maybe it's simply that obese people have low vitamin D and it's all about vitamin D. Others have argued it's gut dysbiosis. Gut dysbiosis occurs in people with obesity. It's associated with weak immunity and uh, low-grade inflammation. So maybe it's gut dysbiosis that's the player here. And it's important to note that there is a gut-lung axis so that gut dysbiosis is linked with respiratory inflammation and respiratory illness. Of course, this may be nothing to do with immunity at all. 
It could be because obesity weakens pulmonary function, for example, or it could be actually it's not obesity, it's the comorbidities of obesity that are posing the risk. And I think we're gonna hear a little bit more about that in the next talk. So this is a figure which sort of captures those ideas that I've just presented to you, which is obesity results in a state of a weakened immune system, chronic inflammation, obviously metabolism is, uh, is, is uh, messed up in obesity. There are effects on the endothelium, but also there are the comorbidities related to uh, the airways and what have you. And there are other things going on in obesity. And then you put that together with exposure to um, a virulent pathogen like uh, coronavirus, and uh, which has the capacity, of course, to produce severe disease, cytokine storm, respiratory illness, what have you. And these factors, one or more of them, maybe it's all of them linked to obesity, increase the likelihood of these things happening and them being more severe. And this uh, together uh, is what I've actually been talking about, the link between obesity and COVID-19. So what I've told you is well-functioning immune system is required for effective defense against pathogens, uh, impaired immunity predisposes to infections and it weakens uh, vaccine responses. I've told you uh, in a lot of detail that the immune system is weakened with obesity. And I think this is an under-recognized result of obesity. Um, and we really need to find out more about that. Obesity is accompanied by low-grade inflammation and this links obesity with its comorbidities and the adverse response to infection. There is a lot of evidence now, as you've seen, there's already 40 meta-analyses uh, at least, there's maybe even more now since I prepared my talk, um, that obesity increases the risk of infection, more serious infection, poor recovery from infection, weaker response to vaccination. That's all pre-COVID literature, increases risk of being infected with coronavirus, increases risk of more severe COVID-19, hospitalization, ICU need, ventilation need, mortality. And then lastly, I talked about the fact there's actually many mechanisms linking obesity with risk of and more severe COVID-19. Thanks very much for your attention. D Diane, you're muted. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you for an outstanding presentation, Dr. Calder. We're now ready for questions. I think with the number of people on, we probably can use the hand raise function. Um, so click on the hand raise if you have a question, or you can put it in chat. And for those of those who are on the, the streaming and can't use chat or hand raise, um, you could send me an email, D-B-I-R-T at I-A-S-T-A-T-E dot E-D-U. So yes, we have, a, we have a hand raise from John Erdman. Yeah, I have a question. Can the um, level of the amount of vaccine used partially overcome the negative effects of obesity? On, um, <laughs> on yeah, that, that's a good question. I haven't, I haven't heard that proposed. Um, I have a feeling that probably wouldn't work very well um, because I think um, most, I mean, of course, this vaccine wasn't trialed uh, greatly before it was put into practice, but I think most vaccines are designed to provide pretty good stimulation of the immune system in healthy, normal weight people. And indeed, that's what happens. Um, so I don't think that would be a strategy. I think we have to find other ways to support the immune response, John. Um, I think it's, it's really important to say that um, the vaccines actually do work quite well. So, um, you know, even in people with obesity, uh, even in older people who have weak immune responses, the vaccines are providing protection, at least to a lot of people. So it's not that they don't work at all, but I think they could be a bit more effective. I mean, we see this every year with the flu vaccine anyway in older people, but I think, um, you know, this is a signpost that this is something to really focus on to find out how we can remedy the situation. Thank you. Uh, 
This is uh, Venkat, uh, Venkat Narayan. So again, a very nice uh, presentation, Philip. Uh, my question is kind of related to the first question. I've got two parts to it. Yeah. Firstly, I mean, should we be considering a different dosage and different periodicity of vaccination for obese individuals, number one? Yeah. And secondly, more importantly, with the long term in mind, uh, if, these, if vaccination has non-specific other benefits in terms of uh, improving the immune function, do you see potential for vaccination to mitigate the uh, adverse consequences of obesity in the future? Yeah, yeah, those are great questions. So, so what we know is many vaccines um, wear off. <laughs> So we lose the antibodies to many vaccines. Of course, to some of them, actually, we can get lifetime protection from some vaccinations. Um, but um, you've seen already data that the flu vaccine, you know, the antibodies wear off over time in everybody. Um, of course, the flu influenza virus is mutating and changing. So we need new vaccines anyway. Um, but I think the evidence is that um, antibodies to the flu vaccine disappear more quickly in people with obesity than normal weight. So I think a strategy could be for the seasonal flu vaccine um, could be, um, you know, as you suggest, giving the vaccine again, perhaps. Um, now we know with COVID-19 for most of the vaccines, we needed two vaccinations to get antibody levels up anyway. That was quite well documented. Um, and now we're seeing um, those antibodies are going away and people need another vaccination. Some people have had that already. So I think um, it may be that at risk groups like uh, older people, um, maybe people with obesity, maybe some others, um, more frequent vaccination could be a strategy for sure. Um, I think in the long term, we have to... Um, you know, this is one reason why we have to try to push to um, reduce obesity. But of course, we already have the individuals with obesity. So we have to find ways of helping their immune response, maybe with other strategies. They could be nutritional strategies. They could be other things. Alan, please ask your question. Thank you. Uh, there was a U-shaped relationship between BMI and some of the severe COVID outcomes. You didn't yep. comment on the effect of low BMI. That's been seen with mortality in general as an endpoint. Is this really just the confounding effect of uh, people with chronic uh, diseases, cancer metastases, et cetera? Do you, well, what is the mechanism of yep. low BMI? Yeah, so, so Alan, I didn't comment on that because I was focusing on obesity rather than rather than underweight or frailty or whatever. But, but we know that, um, underweight uh, is, is, uh, is known to be associated with increased susceptibility to infection, uh, increased mortality from infection. This is well described, obviously, in, in the field, but also in hospitalized patients, um, in, in, uh, you know, in, in uh, uh, settings in, in North America and Europe. So I think, again, this is weakened immunity. And, um, there are interesting data showing that um, frailty is associated with weak responses to the seasonal flu vaccination. So again, I think, you know, at that end of um, BMI, again, we have weak immune systems uh, not dealing very well. Um, the reasons may be um, a little bit different from, an, uh, from obesity. It may uh, be, you know, um, insufficient uh, essential nutrients in general, um, could be the loss of lean mass isn't enough to support a good immune response. Um, so certainly that's a phenomenon that occurs. Um, it may also, as you mentioned, uh, include individuals who have um, serious morbidities that are affecting body weight and that might also affect their susceptibility to infection, yeah. Okay, um, question from George Aline. It's not clear why the increased um, inflammation in the obese predisposed them to an increased risk yeah. of infection or a decreased yeah. response to vaccination. So, so, yeah, so, so um, 
this is really complicated. <laughs> it's a great question, George, because of course, inflammation is part of our immune response. And when we are infected, or indeed when we receive a vaccination, we trigger an inflammatory response. And in fact, most of the symptoms that people report post-vaccination, and you might've had these if you've had your COVID-19 vaccines, are due to your inflammatory response um, kicking off. But it turns out um, there are aspects of inflammation that impair T cell function and B cell function. So in fact, inflammation weakens immunity in its own right. And therefore increased inflammation could uh, predispose to uh, you know, infections getting out of hand. I think the other thing is um, inflammation causes um, uh, you know, adverse respiratory effects, for example. So it predisposes people to those consequences of, um, of viruses that infect uh, the airways. And I think this will have to be our last question from uh, David Metzler. Is it known whether the relationship of obesity to COVID risk varies by race? Um, David, that is a great question, but I don't know the answer. I'm sorry. Um, that answer may be out there. I'm sure um, there will be studies, particularly, I think, from, from the US, uh, from your country, where people have looked at um, looked at ethnicity and obesity um, separately and as an interaction, but I'm not aware of the data. I'm really sorry. But again, I mean, people, you mentioned vitamin D as part of your your question, and again, people have used vitamin D as an explanation for the um, the susceptibility of of different uh, ethnic groups to infection. And then we. Have one last comment about the poor outcomes in underweight people may yep. be very important to the low and middle income countries. Yep. That's from Agreed. Um, yep. Ben Cat. So, um, Connie, did you have one final short comment? No, I was going to transition to the next speaker. Is that all right? <laughs> that is perfect. Great. Thanks Thank so you. much. So yeah. thank you, uh, Professor Calder. That was really fantastic. And now we look forward to hearing uh, Dr. Scott Solomon on COVID-19 and drilling into cardiovascular disease specifically. Dr. Solomon? Sorry, I was on mute. Do you see my slides all right? Connie? Y yes, I have gone on mute also. Uh, yes, okay. we do. Perfect, all right. Well, um, I just wanna thank um, the National Academy and the organizers of this meeting for this invitation to address this extremely important topic uh, that has uh, impacted all of our professional lives, our personal lives, and importantly, the lives of our patients and billions of people around the world. Um, here are my disclosures. Uh, and by way of full disclosure, I need to say that I'm a cardiologist and a cardiovascular researcher who has by necessity had to shift a fair amount of my own research focus over the past year to understanding how COVID affects the cardiovascular system and cardiovascular patients. But I also wanna caution all of you that this is a rapidly evolving field and anything that I might say might very well be out of date in a few short months. We're really just beginning to understand um, some of these relationships. So it was hubris to think that we had essentially conquered infectious disease as a public health threat uh, and that in the cardiovascular field, we could focus exclusively on diseases of overabundance and aging that uh, have been the price that we've paid for relative prosperity and better healthcare and longer lives. But uh, throughout history, our species has been plagued by pandemics. Uh, influenza in particular has struck us in pandemic form four times in the past century, starting with the 1918 flu, 50 to 100 million deaths worldwide and an eerily familiar series of infectious waves. Pandemic flu, um, as you know, occurs every 20 to 50 years. It stems from a viral strain that differs 
antigenically from previous strains due to a sudden genetic reassortment between two closely related strains and the overall lack of immunity in the population uh, correlates with disease severity and excess mortality. And indeed, while the majority of the morbidity and mortality associated with both endemic and pandemic influenza has been pulmonary, there's been a growing recognition that um, influenza in particular and viral illnesses in general could contribute to cardiovascular morbidity, uh, even in the absence of pandemics. For example, uh, in the data shown on the left in, uh, from a large Canadian administrative database, flu was linked to a six-fold increase in the risk of acute myocardial infarction in the days following a laboratory-confirmed infection. And similarly, hospitalizations for heart failure in the ERIC surveillance communities were temporarily related to uh, regional influenza activity in parallel, there's been a growing recognition of the mechanistic links between uh, influenza infection, we heard a little bit about this on the last talk, uh, and cardiovascular disease. Now, coronaviruses have been much less appreciated as human pathogens until much more recently. And in fact, uh, until 2003, only two coronaviruses had been identified, both of which as causes of the common cold. Uh, now, the SARS epidemic of 2003 was a wake-up call uh, to these no novel viruses. About 8,000 people around the world ended up infected with a 10% overall death rate. This was followed by MERS in 2012. As you know, both epidemics burned out fairly quickly. And until 2019, all other known coronaviruses have been associated with self-limited upper respiratory infections. But as you know, in late uh, 2019, a cluster of 27 cases of pneumonia was reported in Wuhan, China. Within weeks, uh, the viral genome for this novel virus was published, and it was shown to be 79% homologous with the 2003 uh, SARS virus. Now, uh, coronaviruses are composed of a shell-like fatty protective membrane studded with these crown-like spike proteins on their surface. That's uh, from which they get their name. These spike proteins mediate the attachment of the virus to the host uh, through uh, ACE2 receptors. And they're also the epitopes that are most immunogenic. They're the targets of both natural and vaccine-induced uh, antibodies. And inside the protective membrane is a single strand of RNA in addition to uh, other structural proteins. Now, I don't need to tell anybody here, it's been 22 plus months, 228 um, million cases worldwide, 4.7 million deaths worldwide, and a world economic impact of $4 trillion. It was quickly recognized um, after the start of the pandemic that the severity of illness with this disease varied widely from asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic to severe or critical disease. And as reports started coming out of China and Italy and New York City, uh, we began to recognize that while the majority of the morbidity and mortality uh, with these severe cases was pulmonary, uh, other organ systems were involved. And the link to the cardiovascular system seemed particularly important, both because uh, of the cardiovascular manifestations that we were seeing in our patients and the fact that cardiovascular risk factors were emerging as important uh, determinants of disease, uh, it became pretty clear uh, that uh, from very early on in the pandemic that cardiovascular risk factors appeared to be the same uh, risk factors for severe COVID-19 disease, uh, not necessarily for becoming infected with COVID, but for severity of illness once infected. Hypertension, obesity, and cardiometabolic disease uh, playing the major role. And uh, as you saw in the last talk, in study after study, several demographic features and comorbidities um, became linked to severe disease. Black race, for example, has consistently been associated with increased risk. And, and by the way, that is uh, even with adjusting for other comorbidities like obesity. Uh, male sex has emerged for an important risk factor uh, for reasons that we're, not, that we're not clear about at all. And age 
um, appears to act synergistically with other comorbidities to um, modify risk. When we look at closely at the risk factors for mortality in COVID-19, um, several patterns begin to emerge. First, there's a clear gradient with age. Um, and we're all aware that especially early on and pre-vaccine, uh, the most vulnerable of our patients were indeed the elderly. Second, a similar gradient was apparent with BMI, with increased risk in those who were severely or morbidly obese, as we heard about um, extensively in the last talk. Other risk factors that have stood out and held up include male sex, uh, history of myocardial infarction, other cardiovascular comorbidities. Uh, obesity, as we heard uh, from Dr. Calder, is not just a risk factor for mortality in COVID, but also for hospitalization, for the need for ICU care, for the need for invasive mechanical ventilation. Uh, but what we see is that this um, uh, risk associated with obesity is actually appears to be greater in younger individuals, uh, as this is a risk factor that appears to become diluted by other risk factors uh, in the older patients. And importantly, if we look at the risk related to obesity, for each of these endpoints in patients over and under 65 years of age, we see attenuation of the effect in these older patients in whom many other risk factors uh, compete. So why might patients with obesity be at increased risk for severe COVID-19? We certainly heard a number of reasons in the last talk. Uh, various hypotheses have been proposed. I, I suspect the jury is to a large extent still out. Uh, there are data suggesting that obesity results, as we just heard, in a low-grade inflammatory state that may have direct negative effects on both innate and adaptive immunity. Uh, obese patients, as Dr. Calder mentioned, are known to have elevation in pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha, MCP1, IL-6, mainly produced by visceral and subcutaneous adipose tissue that um, may contribute to this dysregulated pro-inflammatory response. Patients with obesity also often have compromised respiratory function characterized by decreased lung volumes, decreased diaphragmatic strength, increased airway resistance, impaired gas exchange. And these factors exacerbate the ventilation perfusion mismatch, which is already impaired in COVID-19 and makes these obese patients who require invasive ventilation much harder to ventilate. In addition, ACE2 expression in adipose tissue appears to be higher than that in lung tissue, and this shared viral tropism for both, uh, both tissues may favor prolonged SARS-CoV-2 shedding in obese individuals. We've known for um, a long time that thrombosis is enhanced in obese patients and this may be synergistically increasing the risk of prothrombotic events in severe COVID-19. I'm going to talk more about that in a second. And lastly, there's evidence that widespread microvascular endothelial dysfunction, is, uh, which we know to be the case in obesity, appears to be exacerbated by SARS-CoV-2 SARS infection. So in addition to obesity, um, other cardiovascular risk factors have emerged as, uh, as important, including hypertension. Um, this is an early series of 1,000 patients from China in which the prevalence of hypertension um, in patients presenting with severe disease uh, in the absence of other risk factors was really quite striking. This uh, observation about this relationship between hypertension and severity of disease led to the speculation that the link between um, blood pressure and hypertension and severe disease might indeed be ACE2, which of course is the enzyme by which the virus gains entry. Now, normally ACE2 serves, to ser serves as a counter-regulatory enzyme, mitigating the effects of renin-angiotensin system activation. Unfortunately, uh, some poorly controlled observational studies early in the pandemic suggested that the use of renin-angiotensin system inhibitors, which are, by the way, commonly used in uh, patients with cardiovascular disease, with hypertension, with heart failure, uh, 
might be associated with an increased risk of um, upregulation of ACE2, leading to uh, a possible increased likelihood of viral entry and potentially increased disease severity. Fortunately, there was actually little evidence to support uh, that hypothesis. And in fact, uh, counter hypotheses emerged suggesting that dysregulation of the local renin angiotensin system due to the virus might be contributing to worsening disease. Virtually all of the major cardiovascular societies came out strongly discouraging uh, patients stopping or physicians stopping medications like ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers in patients with hypertension and especially heart failure. And subsequently two randomized trials of uh, withdrawal of these types of medications show there was no um, effect on the course of disease. Uh, now, this is a great example of how poorly controlled observational data led to the wrong conclusions. And this is a problem, unfortunately, that we've had throughout the pandemic, and that uh, uh, certainly has contributed to some of the morbidity that we've seen. The link between COVID and the cardiovascular system has been further strengthened by uh, data showing that the primary biomarkers we use to evaluate risk in cardiovascular disease are elevated in hospitalized COVID patients. High sensitivity troponin, which is a marker of myocardial injury, may be elevated in as many as 30% of patients admitted with COVID-19 to hospital, and it's associated with increased mortality regardless of whether patients have underlying cardiovascular disease. Shown in the right are data from 12,000 patients with natriuretic peptides uh, like NT pro BNP or BNP measured upon hospitalization. And this showed a threefold adjusted increased risk of mortality uh, in those with the highest compared to the lowest quartile, even in the absence of known cardiovascular disease. And although we're seeing evidence of myocardial injury in patients with COVID-19, the question has remained, was this due to the virus attacking the heart directly or simply due to the increased myocardial oxygen demand in the setting of severe illness? Much of the evidence suggests that in most cases, the heart is a bystander um, and it's usually not targeted directly by the virus. Uh, and despite early reports of a lot of acute myocarditis in the setting of COVID-19, the actual incidence of pathologically proven true myocarditis in COVID appears to be quite low. There have been uh, limited data that the virus directly infects the heart. Um, now, uh, what we're seeing, we are seeing now what appears to be a low risk of uh, myocarditis and pericarditis following some COVID vaccines, particularly the mRNA vaccines. And the data suggests that this risk is greatest in young men. Uh, whether this is due to an idiopathic immunologic phenomena or a more nonspecific effect of inflammation induced by the vaccination is uh, as yet unknown. There's also been evidence that acute atherosclerotic events, such as uh, myocardial infarction and ischemic stroke, are increased in the setting of COVID. Uh, in these data, in over 5,000 patients uh, from Denmark, where researchers have access to the health records, of virtually the entire country in near real time. COVID patients who were used as their own uh, controls had a nearly 13-fold increased risk of ischemic stroke and a six-fold increased risk of acute myocardial infarction in the two weeks following a diagnosis with COVID compared with the six months preceding infection. The disease and the pandemic are affecting our most vulnerable cardiovascular patients, such as those with heart failure, uh, disproportionately in, in this large series of over 2 million hospitalizations, uh, patients with a diagnosis of heart failure who were hospitalized with COVID had a nearly twofold increased risk of death compared to those without heart failure. And the risk of uh, a heart failure patient dying during a COVID admission was 12 times the risk of their dying during a heart failure exacerbation. Uh, but it's important to remember that the pandemic has taken a huge toll, not just on those who contract the disease, but has influenced cardiovascular death uh, more broadly in the population. In fact, in the early um, uh, 
COVID surge in Boston in the first spring in 2020, we saw a 40 to 50% decreased incidence of hospitalization for acute MI or heart failure compared to previous years. That was also seen in many other locations. Now, this wasn't because these diseases had been cured. Uh, on the contrary, this was likely due to a combination of patients ignoring symptoms, delaying seeking appropriate medical care, and uh, no surprise, during this time, we saw many complications due to delayed care, such as increased risk of ischemic cardiomyopathy or myocardial rupture, both complications of acute myocardial infarction when care is delayed. Unfortunately, uh, the reduction in hospitalizations was paralleled with an increase in the number of out-of-hospital cardiac deaths and cardiac arrests, as shown here um, in the US, in Italy, on the right in New York City, where out-of-hospital deaths attributed to cardiovascular disease peaked during their 2020 surge. Now, when it, one of the many uh, paradoxes of this disease is that while many people recover from acute infection in about seven to 10 days, in some and clearly way too many uh, patients, the disease progresses to hypoxemia, shortness of breath, and in the most severe cases, uh, acute respiratory distress uh, syndrome and organ dysfunction. There are several pathophysiologic processes that seem to be at play in the development of severe disease uh, that tie into the cardiovascular system. The first, as we heard about in the last talk, is the abnormal activation of the inflammatory response. Now, um, inflammation, of course, is an integral part of the innate immune response to infection, uh, but normally infl inflammation is expected to be proportional to the pathogen burden. Infection with COVID seems to trigger a robust and even exaggerated systemic inflammatory response, sometimes referred to as cytokine storm with an overproduction of a wide variety of uh, inflammatory mediators, including IL-6, IL-1-alpha, IL-1-beta, TNF, many others. Uh, and th many of these markers of inflammation have been shown to predict poor outcome in the disease. The second pathophysiologic theme is increased thrombosis. Both macrovascular thrombosis and microvascular thrombosis, which um, autopsy series have shown occur very commonly uh, in COVID-19, even when these were not recognized pre-mortem. Uh, venous thrombosis, such as deep venous thrombosis, and pulmonary embolism, as shown on the left, have occurred more commonly than expected, and microthrombosis appears to be playing an important pathophysiologic role in the severe lung disease of COVID. Uh, in this comparison uh, of patients who died of COVID, influenza, and uninfected controls, patients with COVID demonstrated severe endothelial injury, disruption of endothelial membranes, occlusion of alveolar capillaries, and even new vessel growth. And taken together, these findings have suggested that acute endothelial injury, what has been termed endotheliitis, likely plays a broad role in this disease. And this is probably due to the fact uh, that the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines during infection can lead to the loss of the antithrombotic, uh, vasodilatory, and antioxidant properties of the normal endothelium. Also, uh, as you know, endothelial cells, when triggered, release endothelial granules, which contain von Willebrand factor and P-selectin, both of which can facilitate platelet aggregation and thrombosis. And nearly all of the risk factors that I've shown uh, have been associated uh, in, in the, all the risk factors that we talked about earlier in the talk have been associated with um, endothelial dysfunction, suggesting that uh, the endothelium may be the link between these risk factors and severe COVID uh, disease. Another uh, really fascinating emerging pathophysiologic concept in COVID-19 is immunothrombosis. And this is the process by which immunologic triggers can cause thrombosis, which in normal settings may be part of the body's normal protective response um, to infection. One emerging uh, key player in this process is uh, neutrophil extracellular traps or NETS. Uh, this is a fabulous acronym because 
nets are these multi-molecular DNA-based structures that are expelled from neutrophils in response to infections and actually look like nets. Unfortunately, uh, net formation can be both thrombogenic and cytotoxic, can damage endothelial and vascular integrity, and may be contributing to rapid pulmonary dysfunction and other complications that we see in COVID. Uh, there, are, there are many other factors uh, that I haven't had time to go into, including genetic factors and our pre-COVID viral exposure history, which may be very uh, important in influencing the host response to infection. We're just beginning to understand these. Putting all these data together suggests that comorbidities uh, that are truly synergistic with viral disease um, in fact, augment risk that activation of uh, platelets and the endothelium seems to predispose patients to more severe disease. And this is much more likely to happen in patients with pre existing cardiovascular uh, risk factors and morbidities. And I think this helps explain why, even with the greater infectivity of the Delta variant and the shift that we've seen over the past several months in the demographics of this disease with more younger patients being infected, it's still uh, quite rare for a young person without comorbidities to develop severe disease. Unfortunately, um, some patients continue to have symptoms for weeks and months after seeming to recover from the acute phase of the disease. Uh, the symptoms of so-called long COVID syndrome, which has now been renamed post-acute sequelae of COVID or PASC, uh, are highly variable in uh, variety, in severity, in duration. Uh, preliminary studies suggest that uh, up to about 30% of patients may report symptoms as long as uh, nine months after acute infection. Of course, we don't know what the tail on this is yet. But, um, these include fatigue, reduced functional capacity, uh, exercise intolerance, shortness of breath, and have been linked to various organ systems, including uh, the cardiovascular system. Uh, there are now several reports of patients with no known prior cardiovascular disease uh, months post-acute infection with evidence of both myocardial edema and fibrosis uh, detected by cardiac MRI. Clearly, understanding the scope of this uh, problem is going to be challenging because of the inherent bias of patients presenting uh, with persistent symptoms, and we clearly are going to need to apply uh, solid epidemiologic methods to truly understand the extent of this problem. Well, as I mentioned, the demographics of this uh, pandemic are changing rapidly. Uh, shown on the left is the age distribution of the new COVID cases in Massachusetts as Delta began to surge in the US uh, this summer. And by far the largest group of uh, patients infected were young people between the ages of 15 and 30. Fortunately, as I said, uh, young people are way less likely to be hospitalized with COVID, but those who do get hospitalized are generally quite sick. And in the survey of nearly a quarter uh, of the hospitals in the US, when young people between ages of 18 to 35 were admitted to the hospital for COVID, 20% of them required ICU care, 10% of them required ventilation, and 3% of them died. And even in the very young, cardiovascular risk factors that we've been discussing, obesity, hypertension, and diabetes markedly increased their risk of this sequelae. Well, um, in 1889, um, a pandemic uh, emerged in Central Asia and then went global with fatigue, fever, severe respiratory uh, symptoms, killing an estimated uh, million people worldwide. This was dubbed the Russian flu, uh, but a lot of new circumstantial evidence suggests that this actually might not have been the flu, but might have been a coronavirus. And it was likely a coronavirus that was isolated in the 1960s. It's now widely known as a cause of the common cold. About 20 to 30% of common colds are caused by four circulating coronaviruses. And the epidemiology of this 19, 1889 disease uh, and the symptomatology were very similar to what we've seen with COVID-19, including relative sparing of young patients, which is different from what we see with influenza and symptoms like anosmia that have become pathognomonic of COVID-19. 
Uh, viruses ha have emerged throughout our history, will continue to emerge. If SARS-CoV-2 follows the same playbook as other coronaviruses that circulate currently in humans, it is very likely this virus will become endemic, causing mild disease in children first exposed to it, with older individuals developing immunity early in life, um, who develop immunity early in life, being relatively protected. Um, nevertheless, as we know, uh, common colds do reinfect us frequently due to antigenic shifts um, uh, caused by mutations in the virus. We know this virus is mutating. It, it's likely that even when the pandemic phase of COVID-19 is over, the endemic phase will continue to engender risk in high-risk individuals, just as influenza does uh, year after year. So exactly uh, 30 years ago uh, this month, uh, two large uh, storms collided in the North Atlantic, not far from where, where I am now in Boston, causing what we uh, typically refer to as the perfect storm, uh, for those of you who read the book or saw, saw the movie. Uh, we are now witnessing a perfect storm that was born from the intersection of these two pandemics, the pandemic of obesity and cardiometabolic disease and COVID-19. Uh, we've seen that uh, the severity of COVID-19 is influenced by known cardiovascular risk factors, including hypertension, metabolic disease, obesity, which is um, increasing in pandemic form across the globe. It is likely that endothelial uh, disease and dysfunction represents the crucial link between cardiovascular risk factors and severe COVID-19 uh, through its effects on the inflammatory immune and thrombotic systems. Um, as the demographics of COVID-19 uh, disease change, risk factors such as obesity, increasingly prevalent in our young patients, appear to play an ever greater role in influencing disease severity. So we're just beginning to understand the role of cardiometabolic risk factors uh, and disease in determining the severity of uh, pathogen-induced diseases, understanding this intersection is the key to the preparedness for the next perfect storm. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for an outstanding presentation, Dr. Solomon. Unfortunately, we have very little time now for questions. Um, maybe we'll push things back and take just a couple of quick questions. So can we get to people to use a hand raise function if they have questions here. Okay. Um, I have on the chat function, let's see, how can a post acute persistent symptoms be distinguished between COVID versus what you would have with adverse offense effects anyway. That's Connie, you wanna explain that question? By his nod of his head, I think he gets it. I, you know, people I, I, who are saying that they have these things because they once had COVID, how do you know if it's due to the COVID or they would have got them anyway? I, this is a, a great question. and. Uh, uh, and by virtue of the fact that so many of these patients who have COVID also have cardiovascular risk factors, um, the real way we're going to have to assess this is obviously through good epidemiologic studies. We can't just look at the numerators. Uh, we can't look at the patients who come to our clinics and say they're having palpitations or um, chest pain. I can tell you that I spend uh, most of my clinic sessions seeing patients like that anyway. And we're gonna have to really understand to what extent we're seeing this in the match controls uh, to know that these persistent or these symptoms are indeed due to uh, persistent effects of the virus and not symptoms that people are simply more aware of. Um, I, I think that there is sort of a hyper acute time when uh, post uh, disease, when we're thinking about everything that's happening in our bodies and 
uh, there is going to be uh, some degree of selection bias there. But it's going to be it's going to require, I think, some very good epidemiology. And the NIH has been supporting um, uh, uh, assessment of uh, post-acute sequelae in large epidemiologic cohorts where we also know about people prior to the pandemic. And we have a question from Henry Brem regarding cardiovascular effects of vaccine. Would you like to ask that, Henry, or you? Well, I can. Uh, uh, you know, it, uh, the, the FDA raised the issue of the Moderna booster that there's concerns that they're not sharing yet with the public from uh, Europe that uh, there are cardiovascular effects of the uh, booster. So the question is, it's coming up from patients is, is what, you know, how real is that and how much of a concern yeah, is that? Yeah, I, 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 I mentioned this briefly and there have been um, cases, uh, relatively small numbers of acute myocarditis and pericarditis following vaccination. Usually um, three to five days uh, post, usually the second vaccination of the series. Um, it's uh, on the order of one in a million people, so very small numbers. It seems to be much higher in young uh, men between the ages of roughly 18 to 35. Um, I believe this is real, but very um, uncommon. Uh, the risk is relatively low. Uh, most of these patients recover uh, so that uh, the, the risk of actually getting um, cardiovascular effects if you have COVID is actually considerably higher than the risk of um, uh, having this problem post uh, vaccine. Um, but it's interesting that it's really only being seen with the mRNA vaccines, um, both uh, Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, not so much with, uh, for example, the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, again, whether this is due to um, an idiopathic immunologic response or more nonspecific inflammation, uh, we don't know. And would, would a person who has a previous history of myocarditis be more at risk of myocarditis secondary to the vaccine, let's say, or, or to COVID for that matter? It's a great question. I don't, I don't think we know the answer to that um, because... That will be a very small number, but I've not seen any data to support that um, somebody who has either cardiovascular disease or a history of myocarditis would be increased risk for the vaccine-related myocarditis, but um, uh, maybe that would be a reason that you might want to think about uh, a non-mRNA vaccine uh, instead of an mRNA vaccine, but I, I have to say that that's based on no data whatsoever. Thank you. One, one final question, um, and we'll make it very brief here. In looking at uh, comorbidity, comorbidities, is there any um, known contribution of social determinants? This is from um, James Gavin. It's a really uh, great question. And one thing that we neither of us really talked about were some of the enormous health disparities that we see uh, in COVID-19. And we know that um, Black patients, patients of color in general, um, ethnic minorities were at markedly increased risk for infection. It, it's hard to sort that out from um, the other uh, comorbidities in, in those groups. Uh, when you adjust for other things, you do still see increased risk in general in these groups. Um, interestingly, uh, when you get to the hospital stage, uh, our own data support suggests that um, you've kind of equalized everything that um, uh, while, uh, for example, black patients are at increased risk for um, uh, developing COVID, they may not be at increased risk for death if they've been hospitalized um, uh, with COVID-19 compared, uh, compared to others. And, and this is an area that we're really going to have to understand much better uh, through the use of good epidemiologic uh, techniques. And just as a final follow-up from our first speaker, Philip Calder, um, he said, yes, social determinants likely will be very important for infection. So thank you all. I, I hate to rush, but I think we need to get to our third speaker. And Connie, you wanna give a brief introduction so we can move forward. It's my 
pleasure to introduce Dr. Dr. Holly Nicastro, who's been a program officer with both NHLBI and NIDDK. But we invite her today to talk about her role as coordinator for nutrition for precision health powered by the all of us research program. And she's going to bring us updates um, in the developments from NIH on precision nutrition, obesity, and diabetes. We're pleased you could join us today, Holly. Great, thank you for having me. Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. So I have been tasked with giving updates from the NIH specifically on precision nutrition, obesity, and diabetes. So I am a program director in the relatively new NIH Office of Nutrition Research. This office was formally established by Dr. Francis Collins, the NIH director, just in January of this year, 2021. Our office's mission is to advance nutrition science to promote health and reduce the burden of diet-related diseases. And you probably know our office in some form has been around. Most of the current staff had been in the NIDDK Office of Nutrition Research. We had a similar charge of coordination of some trans-NIH nutrition activities, but now with the establishment of the NIH Office of Nutrition Research, we're in a much stronger position to advance our goals. Key responsibilities of our office include advising NIH leadership on matters relating to nutrition research, coordinating the implementation of the strategic plan for NIH nutrition research, more on that will come in the next slide, um, and leading and representing NIH on various government-wide committees related to nutrition. The establishment of ONR followed the release of the first ever strategic plan for NIH nutrition research. This plan was released in May 2020, so I hope you've all heard of it. Our timing wasn't great here with the newness of the COVID-19 pandemic at the time. Um, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you take a look. The plan is broken up into four major goals, and each goal has accompanying objectives. Each obje objective could read uh, as if it could be a future initiative or RFA. Now that's not a plan, that's not a promise, but rather these objectives under the four goals identify areas in which NIH may need to take the lead or where accomplishing these goals may require efforts beyond individual investigator initiated R01s, for example. But to be clear, investigator initiated projects remain a major driving force, if not the major driving force of innovation at NIH. Our task as program directors is to identify areas where increased coordination funds or other pushes in the right direction might be needed. And the unifying theme of the plan is precision nutrition. When we say precision nutrition at NIH, what we mean is the goal of developing individualized, actionable dietary recommendations that help everyone figure out what, when, why, and how to eat to optimize health and quality of life. And besides the unifying theme of precision nutrition, there are also five cross-cutting areas woven throughout all of the goals and objectives. And these include minority health and health disparities, the health of women, rigor and reproducibility, data science, system science, and artificial intelligence, and training the scientific workforce. Now, what's not mentioned in the strategic plan, but very much on everyone's mind is the COVID-19 pandemic. Our office and the strategic plan have only ever existed in COVID's world. Uh, so we talk, we hear the word syndemic, we use that frequently now, and we know the COVID-19 pandemic is exacerbating nutrition-related health issues like food insecurity, access to food, hunger, food quality, the supply chain, and so on. And we know and heard very well earlier that diet and nutrition and diet and nutrition-related diseases like obesity, diabetes, heart disease, chronic kidney disease can all influence one's risk of severity of COVID-19 and its complications. So again, even though it's not in our strategic plan, COVID-19 and its complications are being considered in the implementation of the strategic plan. Our office is coordinating the implementation of the plan primarily uh, via seven different working groups and a few um, outside initiatives that I'll talk about. These working groups are developing short and long-term goals on their respective topics and developing workshop concepts, guidance documents, trans-NIH initiatives, or grand challenges. And another activity our office is doing that I wanna make you all aware of is our nutritionals or listening sessions. As COVID hit and travel and in-person meetings stopped, 
we lost our opportunities to have informal and extremely valuable conversations with our extramural stakeholders. So with this effort, anyone can request a session. Our office director, Chris Lynch, will attend, as will any, any uh, relevant NIH subject matter experts or program directors. So I just want to now highlight three efforts that represent the very beginning of implementation of the strategic plan. First, um, hopefully you've heard of this in some way or another. Uh, this project is my baby. This is Nutrition for Precision Health, powered by the All of Us Research Program. The goal of this program is to develop algorithms to predict individual responses to foods and dietary patterns, with the idea that these algorithms can then be used to develop personalized or individualized dietary recommendations. We plan to do this by using a comprehensive set of inputs, so microbiome, genomics, physiological measures, metabolic, behavioral, cognitive, contextual, electronic health records, survey data, environmental data, and we'll do this in the largest and most diverse populations studied to date in a precision nutrition study. We'll accomplish that, we'll engage that large and diverse population by being the first ancillary study to the All of Us Research Program. And this is the 10,000 foot view of the Nutrition for Precision Health or NPH study. It's a modular discovery science study. In the first of three modules, we'll enroll 10,000 All of Us participants and look at their baseline diet for two weeks, so what they're already eating out there in the wild on their own, and study their physiological responses to meal challenges. Module two is a controlled feeding study in 1,500 to 2,000 participants who first completed module one. We'll look at responses to three different short-term intervention diets. The exact diets will be determined by our investigators and our steering committee. Um, but these will be free living studies, meaning participants will receive all of their food through the study, but will otherwise carry on with their regular lives, live at their house, go to work, etc. Module three is a domiciled feeding study. So we'll study the same three diets as in module two, but participants will check into the study centers for each of the three two week intervention periods. Now in all three modules, we'll collect the same potential predictive measures conduct the same mixed meal challenges, and collect the same outcome measures. Again, all to be determined and finalized by the investigators. And then module two, module three in particular, will provide additional opportunities for more detailed and more rigorous sample collection um, and data collection. Then we'll use machine learning and artificial intelligence to develop the algorithms that will predict various health-related responses to foods. And I'll pause here and just say, you'll notice that despite my charge today to address updates in diabetes and obesity, the most of what I'm gonna be talking about is disease or condition agnostic or uh, perhaps disease or condition uh, inclusive. So the exclusion criteria for this study for NPH will be minimal. And we aim to include an incredibly diverse population, including diversity in disease and conditions like obesity and diabetes. So we want people with every BMI, people without diabetes, people with diabetes, people with prediabetes. And we'll also be studying endpoints relevant to these, like blood glucose responses, blood pressure, blood lipids, satiety, and more to be determined by the steering committee. The timeline for this program is that we are close to making initial awards for the program. Uh, we expect that to happen around December of this year, and it'll be funded for an initial five years. Another effort, this one very newly announced, is a T32 program called Advanced Training in Artificial Intelligence for Precision Nutrition Science Research, or APRIN. This concept was recently cleared at the NIH um, Council of Councils meeting um, in September. The goal here is to build a future workforce that will be able to make pivotal discoveries using an increasingly complex landscape of big data and a wide array of data tools to tackle complex biomedical challenges in nutrition science and diet-related chronic diseases. This was concept cleared. So what that means is there's not yet a timeline or a budget attached to it, but our intent to develop this program is now public. We're hopeful that the timing of several April trainees will coincide with the release of the public data set and the tools from Nutrition for Precision Health. And one final effort uh, I wanna highlight is our recent workshop on food insecurity, neighborhood food environment, and nutrition health disparities. 
This happened a few weeks ago in September. Um, I do have the link in the notes of the slide deck, or if you email me, I'll send you this link. Um, but right now, anybody can go and register to access the materials from this workshop, whether or not you attended the workshop live or not. So thank you for your attention through my whirlwind tour of NIH nutrition activities. If you wanna go deeper in any topics, I'm happy to take questions if time remains, or you're always welcome to reach out by email, um, holly.nicastro at nih.gov. Thank you. Thank you very much, Holly, for uh, a wonderful summation of what's happening at uh, NIH, particularly related to nutrition. Um, I see that Alan Spiegel has his hand up. So Alan, first question. Thank you very much for that uh, interesting overview. Uh, I suspect that uh, this has kind of fallen by the wayside, sadly, uh, because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and so I think it's very important that you try to disseminate through a variety of channels uh, information about the strategic plan. But my question, uh, which is not directed at you in a negative sense, or even at my former colleagues at the NIH, I'm speaking from the perspective of being the NIH DDK director from 2000 to 2006, uh, of co-chairing the obesity strategic research plan. And if, for example, uh, one were studying lung cancer, and or cardiopulmonary disease in the late 20th century and was going to frame a plan to do that without directly tackling the role of the tobacco industry, that would be really ludicrous. I'm not being naive. I'm sure there are huge political challenges here, but how can one launch this plan without really directly looking at the fast food industry, sugared beverage industry, all of the industry that is so powerfully, and again, I'm not jumping to conclusions. It's very difficult, uh, lacking really rigorous data to say that the obesity epidemic is due largely or solely to the effect of, of industry. But particularly with regard to health disparities and the, the inequities that we see with regard to uh, prevalence of fast food out, out chains, et cetera. So this is, this is my question. I didn't see in any of what you were outlining directly confronting this issue. That's fair, directly confronting, no, that's not, uh, I can't list for you any immediate initiatives coming out that might directly tack onto that. I will say our partnerships uh, with our other federal partners, so FDA, CDC, USDA, and others, really have been strengthened now that we have a central NIH nutrition research office. We also do have a group that is focused on implementation of nutrition-related programs, practices, and behaviors, and that's where maybe some of these policy-related issues might fall. We have a couple of calls out, I think, led led by NIDDK, I believe, on fast response, rapid response. So a policy related to obesity is about to be implemented, maybe a soda tax or something. You can quickly send in an application, have expedited peer review, expedited council clearance, so that you can get in, collect baseline data before that program or policy takes effect, and then collect uh, your post data as well. Um, so it allows people to move quickly to study these natural experiments or to study policies. Um, that's probably the closest we have to something underway right now to tackle this. I think um, tackling the food environment, um, these industries will require all of the federal partners and not just NIH. Thank you, Holly. We have time for a couple more questions. Um, use the hand raise function or put it in chat. Or if you're part of the web, you can send an email, dbirt at iastate dot edu. Last chance, I'm not seeing anything else come up. Well, thank you again, Holly. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, the uh, session has been outstanding. Great questions, great talks. Um, 
We want to thank all of the public uh, um, participants for joining us. We will be going into a uh, closed member only